Welcome to the Oracle class of uh, October the 31st, 2022. I'm glad to have everyone with us today. We're fortunate to have as our special guest, Alan Lowe, who's the director of the American Museum of Science and Energy. And he's going to give us a presentation on the museum and the K-25 History Center. And also bring us up to speed on the things that have been happening of late, especially the online opportunities that we can share with people who are interested in Oak Ridge, but are not physically in Oak Ridge, or maybe they're planning a trip and this would be something to give them a, a good introduction. So Alan, if you would go ahead and start your presentation, please. And then uh, uh, others, if you have comments or questions about what Alan is presenting, I'm sure he won't mind being interrupted. Just unmute yourself and ask him a question, or if you'll put it in the chat, I'll monitor the chat and uh, and moderate it from there as well. So, uh, Alan, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Ray. Uh, good morning, everyone. Great to once again speak with Oracle, and I really appreciate the opportunity. I always know going into uh, talking to these classes that that uh, most, if not all of you, have been to ANSI probably many times, and uh, hopefully out to K twenty five. So I will uh, I will spare you all the the basic basics, but I want to tell you some of the exciting things going on uh, to make AMZ and K twenty five even even better. Um, make sure my PowerPoint actually works. There you go. Uh, so of course that. There's the exterior of both of our museums, really proud to be director of both. And one of our challenges, and still is a great challenge to have, is how do we combine the operations of both of these? They're run by the same staff, but given that it's about a 20 minute drive between them, we're still thinking out how we connect our educational activities, our outreach activities, our programming activities between the two facilities. But again, it's a great problem to have because they're both amazing, amazing museums. Um, some of you may know, and certainly Ray knows this, is that a big, big change that happened for AMZ happened in 2021, and that's when we moved to a new model of operations. So starting in March of 21, um, the AMZ Foundation became responsible for the operations of both AMZ and the K-25 History Center. That's under something called a cooperative agreement with the Department of Energy. And I won't bore you with all the details, but essentially what it does is it sets up the nonprofit foundation as the operator of the museums. DOE still gives us support. Uh, that support is reduced a little bit every year. Uh, so it's really on us now to run the place, uh, to raise the money, uh, to help in the future, do all the programs and activities we know uh, make this place uh, what it is. So I'm real proud of our foundation board. Ray is a great member of that board and, and, and of the executive committee. He chairs, I don't know, five or six committees for us. And then Jim Campbell is the chairman uh, of the board. And there you see our executive, our executive committee. What this move made possible, you know, previously AMSI had been run, um, when I got here, it was under a DOE contract. So they had an outside contractor running the place. And so a lot of the money that was paid went to that contractor. Understandably, they had to, they ran it um, uh, as a business. Uh, but now this lets us keep all the funds we raise and we make here uh, and plow it back into both museums. It also gives us a lot more flexibility in things like our contracting, our fundraising. We can fundraise now. All those types of things are made possible with this new arrangement. So it's worked really well. DOE is very happy with uh, how we progressed thus far. Uh, we're getting ready to go into our third year of doing it. Is that right? Yeah. So it's it's working really, really well so far, and we intend to keep it that way. Now, the permanent exhibit, as you know, it's divided into the big sections of Manhattan Project and national security, um, um, big science, energy, and environmental management. So what we've tried to do during the pandemic, when we were shut to the public and, and since, is to make tweaks around that permanent exhibit to make it even better. So if you haven't been lately, uh, you would have missed things like we have a, a new case on the nuclear Navy. We have an interactive called Sounds of the Universe uh, around where we talk about Oak Ridge's role in, in the space program. 
Uh, we've, we've added galleries. We've added the Innovation, Innovators Gallery, where we look at innovation in general, often highlighting the technology of a regional company. Sometimes we'll curate our own there talking about innovation, but usually it will be something about uh, a company and how they've utilized technology. Right now, we have uh, the Science and Signal sponsored by AT&T in that gallery, all about uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, we got a great kinetic um, a sculpture uh, from the uh, East Tennessee Children's Hospital, great addition to our, exam to our museum. You see it there in the, the bottom part of the slide. Uh, it's um, amazingly active <laughs> and it's hypnotic. When, when we turn that on, it's, it's a, really an, a great thing to see, but also helps us teach about things like forces of motion and gravity. So we, we found and we're finding even more ways to incorporate it into our educational activities. We also are adding um, this week um, a new addition to the permanent exhibit, a sculpture of the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, a local artist won a competition, and thanks to the uh, generosity of the Art and Arts and Cultural Alliance and the artist, uh, that piece is being donated to us. And so that's going up in our uh, permanent gallery where we'll place a lot of the space-related items over time around that telescope. And it helps us tell that really amazing story of what the Webb Telescope is already showing us about the universe. Uh, NASA, by the way, also awarded us a grant. So in January, we'll get a kiosk from them that shows images uh, from the Webb Telescope and gives us some funding for some education around that as well. So we're really happy with that. Uh, looking to the future in the permanent exhibit, we're talking now to Oak Ridge National Lab about how we do a better job talking about fusion. Uh, it's mentioned now uh, in our energy section, but we need to do more. And so we're talking to those folks there about that. We've also had discussions with environmental management about kind of jazzing up the end of the permanent exhibit, uh, including some videos and other information about the role of both DOEM and their contractors in the, in, the, in the cleanup effort that happened here and more generally about environmental management. So that is underway as well here at AMSI. Next here. K25, um, I always say, I, I wish I could claim credit for the exhibit. It was well-designed already before I got here. And as you may know, it opened in February, um, you know, late February of 2020. We had to close it a few weeks later, I think two or three weeks later due to the pandemic. But now it's reopened, people are discovering it. Um, and it's just a terrific artifact laden exhibit about the foundations of Oak Ridge, the, the history of the Manhattan Project, and of course, the operations of the K25 gaseous diffusion plant, both the science behind it and the people behind it. This really, really well done. Uh, again, what we're trying to do there is find better ways to connect it with AMSI and also think about the special exhibit um, space there. Right now, there's an exhibit mud that was provided to us by the National Park Service about the founding of Oak Ridge. Um, we're now looking, and, and Ray knows about this, about putting an exhibit together about a short snorter note. Ray, I know you know about that, that we're putting together some pretty famous people signed, uh, signed that yeah. dollar bill um, and Tibbets and others uh, among them. So uh, Quinn Argall, our curator, is putting together the next special exhibit that will focus around that note. Uh, there at K25. Also, um, I'm, I'm losing track, and Ray may know this better than I do, uh, there, there are plans to build another building on that site that is called the platform building, because you'll be able to go in, go up some stairs or an elevator, go on a platform and look over the site of where the K25 plant used to be. Around the perimeter of where it used to be, the Park Service is putting, putting signage but the platform building will have exhibits on the platform kind of showing you what the building used to look like and telling, telling visitors more about it. My understanding is we'll be operating that, that building as well, and we'll have the downstairs area uh, for some much needed education space and that type of thing as well. So we're excited about that. We're also hoping, and this uh, put this under the category of dreaming right now, um, Portal 4 as you move into that, as you drive into that area, where people used to have to go through that portal to get on the site. Uh, it's in not really good shape right now, but we're in discussions with, with some folks about how we might be able to be uh, part of the renovation of that and then utilize it as a shop 
uh, perhaps a, a place for food trucks and a coffee shop, those types of things uh, a bit down the road. We know that that whole site is developing quickly with lots of business and businesses moving in. And we think that will help um, make the site even more attractive and also serve the folks who are working there uh, as we go down the road. So a lot of stuff happening at AMSI and at K25. Um, as, as Ray mentioned earlier, let me see if I can get this to go to the next. We're, we're doing so much in our programming, both in-person and virtual. Education always is at the heart of what we do. Um, we have great educators here who meet with classes. They have come back into the museum now. We also have an educator who goes out into classrooms. And the third element that the pandemic really taught us was the virtual element of that. So with terrific grants thus far from Y12 and ORNL, we've been able to use Zoom and go live in the classrooms thanks to Zoom. So we'll send uh, packages out with experiments that the kids can do along with our educators. And uh, they do some amazing programming that way, all tied to standards. Uh, teachers love it. We love it. It's just another way for us to connect. And as Ray said, connect not only here, but around the country. So now we're working with our National Advisory Committee to see where we can take these education programs online to other institutions all around the U.S. Uh, and maybe elsewhere. We'll see. So that's a big part of our education. Also, online, we posted more and more video content. So, you know, as, as you're at home, um, uh, God forbid we have another pandemic, but if homeschoolers or you just want to learn more about a topic, our video library in education continues to get larger and larger. We also continue to do videos for things like QR codes. Those who have started to be placed around the AMS exhibit will do the same at K25. So you can scan those QR codes with your smartphone and get short videos to tell you even more about what are sometimes pretty complex topics uh, so we can better explain them with those videos. Programming, we have so much. We are just getting ready to wrap up the, uh, the current season of the DOE bus tours that we help manage for DOE. Uh, those begin here at AMSI. They go to the K25 History Center, to the X10 Graphite Reactor, and to the Y12 Visitor Center before returning to AMSI. Uh, those end on November 11th for the fall. We're not sure when they'll restart in the spring. That's a discussion we have to have with DOE. And I'm sure that will depend, again, God forbid, on any uh, pandemic issues or anything like that. But we hope uh, those will start um, early uh, next spring again. But again, they're on right now through the 11th of this month of November. Um, we also have things like our online book club, where we have a different book every month that we focus on and, and uh, post about and talk with our friends about. Uh, great book selections. I, I pontificate every month about them, but I want to hear back from our Facebook friends as well. We have a virtual race to space that we have a, a lot of people signed up for now, where you pay a small fee to enter, you get a t-shirt, and as you report your walking or running progress to us, we send you 3D printed medals as if you're racing up through the atmosphere to the space station, which is about 224 miles above us. So uh, we've had a couple people actually uh, reach the space station so far. So uh, I always say I am not among them, but I'm impressed with those who have done that. AMSICAST is my baby, and this, this slide is not my, my best work, but I will tell you, AMSICAST is our podcast. I didn't know what a podcast was a couple of years ago. Now I host a couple of them, and AMSICAST has been a real, a real pleasure to do. We've connected with historians, scientists, engineers, science writers, uh, science fiction writers all around the world. We're around, right around 50 episodes now, everyone from Richard Rhodes uh, to, if you've seen the movie The Martian, Andy Weir spoke with me about his, his work, uh, of course, Thomas Zachariah, uh, great guy, Guru Madhavan, just joined uh, from the National Academy of Engineering, a guy named Ray Smith and Dwayne Speaks joined us to talk about East Tennessee, in World War II. So list goes on and on. I've tried to make sure that it's a pretty eclectic mix of topics, science and engineering topics. Of course, some focus on the Manhattan Project, on physics and energy, but also trying to find those folks to talk to me about evolution or geology. They're trying to find as many interesting topics as possible. Um, one of my favorite was with David Hansen, the head of Hansen Robotics. 
really uh, a guy so smart. I, I struggled to keep up with him, but it was a great interview about the future of robotics. We even got into the issue of robot rights down the road, which was absolutely fascinating. So you can you can find AMZ Cast wherever you find podcasts. Please do please do check it out. We also have started uh, AMZ Quiz, which has become a fun element, both going out to places and sometimes incorporating it here. As Ray saw, we incorporated AMZ Quiz into our volunteer lunch last week. It's a, a set of easy and hard and really hard science questions. We go out, this was from when we did it at Crafters Brew here in Oak Ridge. And uh, we buy the first beer for whoever takes part, whoever's brave enough to try to answer the questions. And the easy ones, you get pins and stickers. If you get the harder ones, you get a mug. And if you get the really fifth question, the fifth question is really hard. But if you get that, you get an, a year-long AMZ membership. Uh, and a few people have, have done that. That just tells me I got to make the harder questions harder. But I don't know about that. We also started a series of public programming called the Sip of Science series. Uh, well, we'll have food and drink and some interesting topics. The first one focused, it's just finished on October 22nd. We had a whole day focused on pollen power, the importance of pollinators. And we had vendors uh, selling honey and mead. Uh, we had uh, all kinds of speakers from TVA, uh, from other places around the state. We had educational programs uh, for adults and for kids. Our educators did the waggle dance, uh, which you have to find online. It's pretty funny. Uh, so it was a really a fun day. A lot of people came in, and it's just the beginning of this series of, of public programming. We'll probably do uh, one each season is our thought right now. We definitely will have one in, in the spring. This is also one of my babies. We were very fortunate uh, earlier this year to get a Humanities Tennessee grant to create another online video uh, audio catalog called The Stem of History. For those of you who know me, I was a historian for many years working in presidential library. So I, I love that connection of science and history. So the question we posited to, to Humanities Tennessee and they liked it was, how can knowledge and use of science and engineering inform the work of historians? So uh, perhaps the easiest example that we've worked with is I've been talking to people about the periodic table. So how, if you're uh, studying maybe the uh, economic history and you wonder why has gold usually been a medium of currency or exchange, knowing its physical properties, its chemical properties from the periodic table helps explain why that's the case. Um, we've also talked to archeologists and geneticists and others. That catalog will be posted online by the end of November. So starting in December, the beginnings of that will be there. My hope is, even though that grant is done then, that we'll continue to add to that catalog over time. And it goes the other way too. So how can scientists benefit from knowing the history of, of the topic perhaps they're studying? It's been a fascinating set of conversations with people, again, from all around, all around the world. Memberships, I always have to say, we're putting a, a real focus now on being entrepreneurial at the AMZ Foundation. And there's, a, we sell uh, memberships, a very important part um, of what we do. And we started the 117 Society, kind of the upper level uh, membership. Uh, you get certain perks for being in there. Uh, and we're going to have a program on April 22nd of next year, which is a fundraising gala for, for AMZ, but we'll give even more information at that gala about the 117 Society. Of course, it's named in honor of Element 117, Tennessee, which Oak Ridge National Lab plays as a key role in discovering or creating. Volunteers, a, a big change here, uh, and many of you know her, uh, Glenda Bingham is retiring at the end of November. Uh, despite my crying and many, many pleas not to. Uh, she has served here, I think, since 1994. Amazing person. We're going to miss her dearly. We're, we're now uh, looking through a, a whole stack of resumes for her, uh, her replacement. Can't really say replacement, but the next volunteer coordinator. Uh, in the meantime, we always need volunteers. So if you or others uh, have an interest, please let us know. Um, obviously, we need uh, volunteers here at AMZ and at K25 to help greet and, and talk with our guests. I'd love to get even more volunteers so we could incorporate 
Uh, there are services in educational programs and those types of things as well. And there you see some of them, some of their smiling faces. Um, they help us out with in so many ways, like the, the Pollen Power program, we couldn't have done without help from our volunteers. Uh, so please do, do let us know if you want to be part of the, the AMZ uh, Foundation family. There's our, our fun social media information. Again, uh, you're talking to a guy who a few years ago was just on LinkedIn, but now I'm on all these. <laughs> and certainly Matt Mullins is our great marketing and social media director here. He puts up a ton of information. So please check out the AMZ Facebook page and our websites at amz.org and k25historycenter.org. All these programs I've talked about today, uh, we put updates on there about these uh, and you'll, you'll find all that info on those websites or on that Facebook page. So with that, uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions you have, but as I hope you can tell, this is a really dynamic place. Uh, you know, AMZ has a long history in Oak Ridge since 49. Uh, K25 is the new baby on the block, uh, but both of them are amazing resources. And we're determined to put us on a sound financial basis moving forward in this new model and to make sure that when people come here, they're learning, they're inspired, uh, that they're seeing something interesting, uh, some new elements here and there on a fairly regular basis. Uh, so if you've been, come back. If you haven't been, please come see us. And uh, thank you very much for your support of our museums. Thank you, Alan. If you'll stop sharing your screen now, I'll bring the view back. All right, let's see. All right, All right. there you go. All right, now we've got everyone back that's on uh zoom with us so please ask alan any question just unmute yourself and ask any question you'd like of the uh amzi museum or the k25 or anything alan's presented so bring your questions to him now or anything else i'll try to answer any question <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. it might not be accurate on other stuff but i'll try <laughs> What days do you offer the tours? Yeah, uh, they've been Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And we'll, we'll see uh, in the spring, we'll have to see where we stand on that. Uh, we, we had hoped to make them five days a week, uh, but, but to be honest with you, the, the pandemic uh, still had our volunteer numbers somewhat low. And we always have two volunteers on each bus. So we, we did three days a week this fall. And that, that we were able to handle the demand that way. So we'll have to see how that goes next spring, at least Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and maybe more, I would say. Alan, I believe you've been able to increase the capacity on the bus in recent weeks. You're back up to full capacity now. We are, yes. So we, we had to follow the DOE rules on that, understandably. And they, just a few weeks ago, let us go back up to full capacity and no mask on, on the bus. Unless, of course, you want to wear a mask. But... But uh, yeah, they, they thankfully uh, released those restrictions. Uh, are all of your buses full? Every time. Yes, and you book online. So uh, it's going to amzi.org and you'll see the connection there to do that. Um, but they are, they are typically full. Now you can always um, check. The first time you might check and it's full and next time maybe someone's dropped out, but typically they're, they're full. Do you also save just a few seats for walk-ons? Do you still do that? Yeah, I think we save a couple. Uh, but here, here recently, it's been difficult, particularly yeah. when we were down reduced seats. Yeah. So, um, and, and there's been such a demand. But if you, if the last second you, you want to give it a shot, we try to save a couple seats. And if you wanted to do that, you need to be there sometime between 8.30 and a quarter to nine. I believe it leaves at nine o'clock sharp, is that correct? It does, yes. The doors, we, we start letting folks in at 8.30. And if you are trying to walk on, you need to be there right at 8.30 because you have to go through kind of a, a sign-up process that normally you do online. Um, and then, yeah, bus leaves at nine, they're back here at 12.30. Um, so it's a great tour. Um, and I really do, if, if you want to do it, I highly encourage you to go online and do it. That way, there's no uh, question that you'll be able to get on the bus. And it is good to plan at least a month in advance if you can, because these seats fill up quickly. And I think when the bus is full, I think you pull that option off. 
online. So right. if it's there, you can sign up for it. And if it's full, it won't be there. And our hope is to start that back the 1st of March. That routine or that normally has been the schedule from March to November. I don't yeah. know why we wouldn't do that again next year. And I don't know why we wouldn't do it for five days. Uh, right. And, and the only the only question on the five days is making sure I have the folks to do it. But I think I will by then. By then, hopefully, again, this is the pandemic's a bad memory. And we can go on and, and do that. And again, with the OE, you're right. I hope it's right around the 1st of March. I'm just waiting on them to give me that uh, that official date. So I'll give you just a little more insight from the foundation standpoint. Uh, we do realize the value of this tour. We also know that uh, at Y-12, there's work being done as we speak on building 9731. They're putting in bathroom facilities on the ground floor. Uh, they're cleaning the building and preparing it for more public access. Now, I can't commit them to any schedule. I know that they are working it hard. And uh, just about, I guess, a month ago now, Helen, we had the uh, Medal of Honor recipients had their convention in Knoxville. Now, they had that convention in 2014 in Knoxville. I was privileged to be part of the competition to bring them here. We made a video. <laughs> we beat out Omaha, Nebraska, and got them here in 2014, <laughs> primarily because we included tours of Oak Ridge. That's the thing that we had that Omaha couldn't match. So they came here in 2014. Now, the interesting thing is these Medal of Honor recipients are wanted all over the nation. I mean, people compete for their conventions and they rarely go to the same place twice. But they in fact did want to come back to Knoxville because of Oak Ridge. And we again provided them tours of, uh, of Oak Ridge as a part of their convention. <laughs> I rode four buses over. <laughs> Oh, Ray showed great stamina that day. <laughs> I really was tired at the end of the day, but I would bring a bus load from the hotel in Knoxville and drop them off either at Y-12 or at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And they would have a, a truck sitting right there where the bus is going to stop. I'd get off the bus, get on the truck, go back to Knoxville, get off, get on another bus and bring them over here. Some of them had uh, scheduled to go to schools. They have a really good school program. Uh, Character Counts is the name of it. And several schools in the area utilize that, uh, that information provided by the Medal of Honor Society. And they wanted to take some of these recipients out to these schools and let them interact with the kids. So they had arranged for helicopters to fly them out to the schools and then back to the hotel to catch a, a later bus to go in for the uh, part of the tours. We didn't schedule the tours until the afternoon. They had a, an event at Y-12 that was a panel event. <clears throat> so didn't all of them have to be here at the first thing in the morning. Had a breakfast at the, at the hotel, which I was privileged to be invited to, enjoyed that. But the weather that day was not suitable for the helicopters. So they had to drive on the road to take these recipients out to the schools. So some of them didn't get to go to Oak Ridge and uh, because they just didn't get back in time to catch the, one of the buses that was going over. So the ones that did go to Oak Ridge was talking about it over the rest of the week to the ones that didn't get to go. And the ones that didn't get to go started talking to the planners of the uh, convention and said, look, we missed that trip to Oak Ridge. <laughs> and what are we going to do about that? <laughs> and they finally decided, well, bring that man over here and let that us talk to him at least. So I got <laughs> an encore invitation 
and was brought back to the hotel on Saturday and spent the afternoon talking to the ones that didn't get to go to Oak Ridge. And, and I want to just finish my personal involvement with that. Uh, an amazing thing happened out of it. Uh, the uh, One of the Medal of Honor recipients, Kyle Carpenter, he's the youngest living or surviving Medal of Honor recipient. And uh, he wanted to come back to Oak Ridge. And he, like Alan, has a podcast. And uh, he wanted someone to be on that podcast when he came back for a, an additional tour. So we arranged for the tour and had him to come back. And then I was the one that got to do the podcast with him. I had a an hour and 12 minutes talking with <laughs> Al Carpenter, answering his questions about the Manhattan Project. And if you want to find that, just Google Kyle, K-Y-L-E, Carpenter podcast, and it'll come right up. And you can, you can see <laughs> he interviews interesting people like General Mattis <laughs> and then Ray Smith. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Good company you're keeping there, uh, it's, it's amazing what happens sometimes. But I'll tell you, I just had that one other thing, Ray. You reminded me when you mentioned Y12. We had a another special guest here about a week or so ago. Uh, Opal Talbot came to visit yeah. with us. Uh, she was celebrating her 101st birthday yeah. that day, and she uh, was a Calutron girl during the uh, during the Manhattan Project, working at Y12. So, uh, for her first time back to Oak Ridge since the Manhattan Project, came down from Kentucky where she lives with a bunch of family and friends. Um, it's a small world. Her family and friends knew a bunch of people I know in Kentucky. That's where I grew up. So it was like a big uh, family and friend reunion. And we had a heck of a, a fun day with her. She came here and we had cake and celebration. Then she went over to Y12 and took a, a car tour. Jean Patterson over there showed her around. And at the end, uh, Opal couldn't hear well, but she was so, so fun and so nice. And at the end, Jean said, uh, how did you enjoy that? And she goes, it was the a young man, it was the best tour I ever had, but I didn't hear a thing you said. So I thought it was pretty fun. <laughs> but she was just a delight, really. Yeah, she was for sure. And I was glad to be able to talk with her. And by the way, she has agreed to be a part of a uh, documentary film, actually a, a movie, I think that's, well, it's a documentary film that's being produced by some people in England and I can't, I, they've, they've cautioned me not to say this, <laughs> so don't repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think they're pitching it to the History Channel and, and to others. I mean, they're, they're an in, independent filmmaker that's trying to produce a, a movie about the women in Oak Ridge. And of course, I've connected them with Denise Karen and then the the girls of Atomic City, but they want to talk to some real live, actual folks that work there. So I'll make a plea to you. Uh, I've, I've been using Ruth Huddleston uh, for the last several months, actually for a year or so now, maybe two. Actually before the pandemic, time flies. But she is uh, in Atlanta now and it's, very difficult for me to, I mean, her son helped me with the Zoom to get her on before, but she's living with her daughter and it's not as easy to make that connection. If any of you know anyone, uh, any ladies that worked at Y-12 who are still alive, <clears throat> please let me know. I would like to get them included in this movie effort that's taking place. Speaking of movies, you realize that there is a movie going to be out in June of 2023 named Oppenheimer. So I expect to see an increased emphasis and interest in the Manhattan Project as that movie comes online. And it's being produced. Alan, you may know who's doing it. I can't remember. But it's a big name television, or not television, movie uh, produ production company that's doing it. 
I did know. I know uh, we did an interview with Kai Bird on AmgieCast, and yeah. you know, he's involved in, in that with he American is. Prometheus. Yeah. Right. I don't remember because, now who. Yeah. Because of his book, he is involved. Kai is. And uh, Phil, you held your hand up. Would you like to ask a question or make a comment? Yeah, I um, I grew up in Oak Ridge and I left in 1983. And uh, obviously a lot of things have, have changed uh, since I moved back to East Tennessee just last year. I'm curious, so the K-25 uh, museum, you can go to on your own, is that correct? That's right, that's, that's right, but, yes. But you can't get to the graphite reactor on your own. That's right, that's on the grounds of the lab, right? Okay, right. yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot of things, a lot of that kind of stuff has changed uh, since since I left the area. But I just sure. wanted to let you know that I was a museum worker from 1980 to 1983. I, I worked oh. at AMSI as a seasonal worker. Oh, very good. And, and what a fun time it was, especially during the World's Fair, to work at AMSI because that that was a that was a great time to be there. Very neat. Well, come come back. I will. Back I, actually, I'm very happy to see that it's still. Uh, still going strong, and it sound, I was happy to hear about the the new programs and things like that. So, um, so I, I will see you sometime. Look forward to seeing you then. Yeah. See, Alan, your day was not wasted. You've got a volunteer here. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. I'll go ahead and write down that you've committed to many hours. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much. Really yeah. appreciate. It. Any other questions or comments for? For Alan. Alan, you're free to stay with us. We're just going to continue this conversation. And uh, you may even be able to join in. But if you have something else that you have to do, I understand. They always have AMSI work for me here, right? So I'm going to go. Okay. I'm going to go take care of that. But thank all you right. all again. Really appreciate and, it. And thank you for being thank with you. us. Sure thing. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. All right, the time is yours. What would you like to have talked about regarding Oak Ridge? Any subject is a, is a fair game for you to bring up now. So what would you like to talk about? Well, it's Halloween. Do you have any scary stories? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. I'm afraid I don't, but I do often get the question about Oak Ridge. What is underground in Oak Ridge? And they, the story that's out there is that there's a huge tunnel underneath Oak Ridge. Now, that's not a Halloween story, but it's as close as I can get to a, a spooky story right now. And that... Uh, theoretical tunnel that's underneath Oak Ridge. All of you know this, I'm sure, but I'll tell you about a person that explored it a few years ago. The writing team of Jefferson and Bass, John Jefferson and Dr. William Bass from UT Body Farm fame, they wrote a book called The Bones of Betrayal, and it's set in Oak Ridge. They wanted me to help them find a place where a uh, body could be buried from the Manhattan Project and be detected today because of the scientist at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory named Dr. Vass with a V, V-A-S-S, -S, who had invented a, uh, a piece of equipment that could detect the gases of decay in flesh from underground just by going across the top. They actually had him to go out to California and see if he could find more dead bodies at the Charles Manson Ranch. I don't think he found any more, but they wrote him in this book and I took him over to Katie's Kitchen, uh, which is over on the Walker Watershed over near the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, just off of the south slope of Chestnut Ridge. It's where the uranium was stored uh, for a year. It was called Operation Dog back then, 47 to 48. And it had, uh, they, they dug a tunnel back in the 
oil dug a, a space back into the ridge and put a vault back there, it's still there today. And uh, they stored the uranium 235 there for, for just about a year. And then they decided that really wasn't what they needed to do. And they began to store it at the locations. But initially they, they wanted to hide it. They were so concerned and they they put a shell over the building to make it look like a barn and built a silo beside it and put guards up in the top of the silo. The silo is still there. The barn covering has been taken off the building. But when I took John Jefferson and Dr. Bass over there, they just really liked that location. So they wrote that into the book. <laughs> uh, a, John also really liked a picture that he saw of a young lady sitting at the Calutron controls. And he put that in his book and he was so delighted with that. I, I found that young lady that was in that picture, Lucille Whitman. And uh, Tennessee Eastman operated Y-12 at the time. And she never worked at Y-12. She was not a Calutron girl. She was a Kodak model, a very pretty model, I might add. And that's why they chose her. So when John and Dr. Bass had their book launch out at the Y-12 New Hope facility, I brought Lucille there. <laughs> and I made a picture of that one, blew up a picture and framed it and had her to sign it for him that night. And then when she got through signing it, no, he was so proud to have it. I said, now, Lucille, <laughs> Tell him what your role was in that picture. <laughs> he about died when I told him, or when she told him that she was a Kodak model. <laughs> but that was a fun night. Now, in the research for that book, they had the murder victim in the swimming pool at the, uh, at the uh, hotel, the guest house. The swimming pool's been covered in, filled in now. It's no longer there, but it was at the east end of the of the hotel and they had the dead body to be found in that in that swimming pool but in in the course of doing the research he john heard this same story about the tunnel under oak ridge and he wanted to explore it so he went to the city to the public works department and told them said i'm gonna explore this tunnel <laughs> and they laughed at him and said really what you're talking about is a storm sewer and he said, yeah, I know, and I want to go down in it. So they told him, okay, go ahead. <laughs> so he did. And I've talked to, uh, he went in up around Blankenship Field and came out down near the turnpike. But I've talked to people who have actually been in that storm sewer, and it is very large. You can walk in it. And uh, he, uh, he enjoyed exploring that and included, I think, some of it in the book. But, the book is Bones of Betrayal by Jefferson Bass. That's as good as I can get to a Halloween story. <laughs> Sorry, Karen, but that uh, that's as close as I can get. What else would you like to talk about? What is the best way to keep involved about all the special events that are held at the museum? Uh, the, the best way is to watch their website, but also a good place to look is Explore Oak Ridge on social media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and they have a website. But she, uh, Katie Watt keeps a, uh, a calendar of events on the website and and on that social media. So between the American Museum of Science and Energy social media and uh, and their website as well, and Explore Oak Ridge website and social media, I think those are the two best ways to keep up with what's happening in Oak Ridge. Of course, we still have the Oak Ridger and there are things that are published in there. You can find that online and you also can still get a paper copy, at least for a little while. I don't know how much longer it's going to last, but it uh, it's still available at this point. And I don't mean to be discouraging about it, 
it's just a fact of life with local newspapers there having a hard time surviving because of the uh, huge amount of information that's available online. So explore Oak Ridge and the AMZ website and social medias. Uh, anyone else have any thoughts on that, that that I may have overlooked? Any way to keep up with Oak Ridge in addition to those, what's happening in Oak Ridge special events? <clears throat> All right. What other questions do you have or comments? Which uh, the museum here in town or K25, which has a bookstore or uh, things for gifts yeah. and that is a bigger one or do they have, do they each have one? Uh, <clears throat> yes, they do. The largest selection is in the discovery shop at the American Museum of Science and Energy, but they also have a selection out at the K-25 History Center. And there are two other places in Oak Ridge in addition to the bookstore, obviously, but the Children's Museum has a selection there with the Manhattan Project National Historical Park Visitor Center located in the main lobby. They have a, a small bookstore and a souvenir store. You can buy things associated with the national park there. You can get your uh, book stamped if you keep a uh, one of those national park pass books, you can get it stamped there. Of course, you'll only get one third of the stamp. You have to go to Los Alamos, New Mexico, and Hanford, Washington to get the other two thirds, one third at each of those. <clears throat> and then the uh, Oak Ridge History Museum also has a good selection of books available just inside the door to the right as you come in. They have a, a, a large selection of very good books uh, for the uh, for Oak Ridge History. And a final one is Jefferson Drugstore. You can find some books selections there. And, and I might add that the Oak Ridge History Museum is going to be our uh, special guest at our class next Monday. So you'll get to see in that museum and learn uh, from Carla Mullins. And I'm, I think Mick Weist will be there too. He's uh, president of the organization and Carla has the museum, the director of the museum, and they're going to do something similar to what uh, Alan did for us today about the Oak Ridge History Museum. But those are the places that come to my mind that you can find books. Of course, at the at Books A Million, there's a local book section there. <clears throat> I can't overlook Amazon. <laughs> you can buy most anything on Amazon now. Ray, where is the Oak Ridge History Museum? It's located at 102 Robertsville Road in the Midtown Community Center. It's an original uh, Manhattan Project location building. It actually was known as the Wildcat Den. For oh, oh yeah, years. I know where the Wildcat Den is. Okay, okay. <laughs> that, that, that made the connection for All you. All right, good enough. That's, that's where it is. Now, it's open Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, 10 to 2 on Thursday and Friday, and 10 to 3 on Saturday. And uh, if you're bringing a tour into town and you'll get in contact with me, I, I have a key to the museum, and I can... Uh, I can get us in any time, and I do that. I take tours through there any time that they want to go, and uh, Carla understands that and encourages it, as a matter of fact, because many tours come to Oak Ridge that are not there on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Now, they would open it more if they had more volunteers, so I don't want to miss an opportunity to say if you're interested in volunteering for the Oak Ridge History Museum, just go by and tell Carla and she'll help you make the arrangements. It's actually a part of the Oak Ridge Heritage and Preservation Association and Terry Dom is on here with us. He's a part of that organization as well as I am. 
And we would love to have you as a part of, of our membership, the local historical society. And obviously there are other volunteer opportunities that, that we have as well. So Terry, anything you'd want to add to that? Uh, well, thank, Ray, thanks for, for plugging the uh, Oak Ridge History Museum. They, uh, there's a membership meeting coming up uh, on November 10th, where they're going to be celebrating the Oak Ridge Bombers, the baseball team that uh, played here in the early years. Uh, admissions free. I believe it's, uh, I don't have my calendar in front of me. I want to say seven o'clock, but uh, uh, it, it is uh, seven, yeah, seven o'clock on Thursday the 10th. And so I'm any of you uh, have would like to come join us, we'd, uh, we'd love to have you. I'm glad you mentioned that. I will get Katatra to be on here next week. Uh, she's been the one that's pulled that together as much as anyone, and uh, I think it'd be good to have her come on and let folks ask her questions about the Oak Ridge bombers. And I can't, <laughs> I can't go without saying that I had the opportunity several years ago to write four historically speaking columns about the Oak Ridge bombers. And uh, I'll be glad to provide anybody links to those that are interested in it. Just send me an email. DR, D. Ray Smith at Comcast.net, or you can go to the Oak Ridger, and I believe you can find them by, by in their archives by looking up the Oak Ridge bombers. Ray, if, if I could, I'll mention one more thing. Uh, we have uh, just constructed a, a very authentic replica of the uh, original Oak Ridge Hutments that housed uh, the construction workers during the war yeah. uh, and planned to, to, we had, you can, if you visit the museum, you can walk around and look at the outside. Uh, we're busy working, getting it set up with uh, furnishings that will be uh, similar. This, this is a 16 by 16 building that housed four people <laughs> uh, with, a, with a stove in the middle. Uh, so, uh, it's going to be a really good exhibit, and by spring we'll have a special showing to open that up. But uh, if you're down there uh, visiting the museum, you might want to stop by and take a look at that. I, I thank you for that, Terry. That uh, hutment is very authentic. It, it, it's been well done, and I look forward to being able to get inside it. <laughs> Terry mentioned that there, <clears throat> there were a bed on each of the four walls. I've been told that they sometimes had either eight or even maybe 10 people sharing a hut mutt. And you remember they worked in shifts. So when one was at work, one group at work, the other one would be sleeping and they would swap out. And that they, they may have even put a fifth bed in there at once. I, I don't know about that, but I do know that when, uh, when they were building K-25, uh, 15,000 people lived in Happy Valley. And I see by the K-25 History Center that there were 1,500 Hutmans. I didn't know there were that many of them out there. But anyway, our time is up. I apologize again for the mix up on, and I don't have a clue where that meeting went, <clears throat> but this meeting that I have here, uh, I will make sure that we have it available next week, or I'll send out another email if I have to change it. Any other final comments or questions from anyone? Thank you very much for being here. I appreciate your patience and I appreciate your questions more than you know. And we'll see those of you that want to come back. We'll see you next week, same time. Hopefully the same, <laughs> same uh, uh, Zoom meeting.